Good morning, saints. Good morning, sinners. Welcome to this day of the Lord as we celebrate the second Sunday of Easter. Uh, this is resurrection. This is victory. And here we are. Although, I don't know, but I don't know about you, but usually the second Sunday of Easter is called Low Sunday. And the greeting for the Low Sunday is the following. I say, this is Low Sunday, and you say, Low Sunday indeed. All right? <laughs> but let me, uh, and then I say again, this is Low Sunday, and then you say, the attendance shows it. <laughs> I mean, compared to Easter. So let's try it. This is Low Sunday. This is low Sunday. The attendance shows. But no, not, not today. I think that we are pretty good today. And I welcome all of you who uh, gained the strength and, you know, to be here present to celebrate this day, to worship our God, to give praise and honor to our God. And uh, I welcome uh, uh, those of you who are here for the first time. My name is David Lagos Fonseca. I'm the pastor here. And uh, it's a privilege to have you here. Here we are a congregation that meets to uh, follow Jesus, to follow God, and to honor uh, God through what we do and say in our involvement in the community and in the lives of the many people we touch each and every day. And we also welcome those who are watching online, and wave to that camera there. Good morning, and I'm, I'm sure it's not low Sunday for you because you've been faithful every Sunday watching from home so and from many other places, so we welcome you. It's, it's great to have you with us this day. Um, there is an attendance pad at the end of your pew. Please uh, just uh, uh, fill it out. Let us know that you are here. Also, there is a Connect card, and that Connect card has the purpose. If you need a prayer or if you need a pastor's visit, if, as I said the other day, if you want to go with me to a big, big bowl uh, to have some conversation, I'll be more than happy to, 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 to have you take me there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, happy to minister to you in any ways we can. And today we have a couple of announcements, and the, the first one, uh, go ahead, Scott, is that we will have two Sundays with cantatas. Next Sunday, the cantata is um, entitled, He Shall Arise, and next Sunday it will be at Hinsdale United Methodist Church in Hinsdale. And if you would like to be there just to enjoy two cantatas, you are more than welcome uh, to do so. <clears throat> we will provide you with the address, and, uh, but um, just leave your offering here. Um. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it might get in the way as you go there. Um, and then on April the 21st, we will have the cantata coming here with a, a combined choir and a full orchestra. I mean, you've seen the orchestra for Sunday, uh, Easter Sunday, but this is a full orchestra, so it's going to be magnificent. So, and the choir has put so many hours for this, and I've seen, you know, they are exhausted, but joyful because they're going to sing to the Lord, He shall arise. So, you are welcome to join us. And Gloria Cole has an important announcement for us. No, 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 you're fine. And you can use the pulpit microphone there. Yes. Yes. You know, we move the pulpit. Yes. And I'm a creature of habit. Uh, good morning. My name is Gloria Cole. Our daughter Paula was diagnosed with MS, multiple sclerosis, when she was a 20-year-old student at Ohio State University. But her life has come full circle. She is currently living and working in Columbus, Ohio. And she recently had an opportunity to participate in a series of educational videos regarding MS. 
The videos focus on the underdiagnosis of MS first and also underdiagnosed in African American community, especially women. Uh, what, so what we would like for you to do is join us in Fellowship Hall immediately after the service to view Paula's journey with MS. And I'm not sure if I said, so I have to say it so Claire won't say you didn't say this. The video, we didn't do the video. The vi video was produced by the Wexler Center at the Ohio State University Medical Complex. So it was a video that has been distributed throughout the country. Thank you. I watched it already, and it's a great video, so I invite you to, to, to watch it. Thank you, Gloria. So, are you ready for worship? How are you doing today? You know, this is a safe place, by the way. You can bring your doubts here. You can bring your big questions here. You can bring, you know, all those things that are nagging you because, yes, we're all looking for certainty. But sometimes that kind of certainty uh, is hard to find. But one thing is, is certain is that Christ is risen. See, are you, are you, are you kind of, are you awake? Are you with me here? All right, let's do it again. Christ is risen. That's more like it. Thank you. So in that spirit, I'm going to invite you to stand and sing this beautiful hymn, 310, He Lives. Beautiful. Please uh, be seated. I invite you now to bow our heads in prayer. On this day, O oh Lord, we thank you for your resurrection, for it is life-changing, life-giving, and life-sustaining. And so we gather here today, especially on these days, 
uh, with uh, our hopes renewed. And we ask that you be present among us in our singing, in our being together, in our conversations, in our prayers. And may our thoughts today, O Lord, center on the message that that you have come to the world, that, that light has come to chase away shadows. Community has been born to remove our isolation and and joy has been shared and heaped upon us that we might share it with the world. Lord, we thank you for your presence in our lives, for the power of resurrection, and we hope it will continue to go with us in everything we do and say. And Lord, whatever we are looking and seeking today, grant us what we need. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel His mighty power and His grace. As we continue with our worship, um, I invite you now to share your joys and concerns. The ushers will bring a microphone. Please place it in front of you, uh, close to your mouth, so that we can hear your joy or concern. And I also say your name so we can uh, acknowledge that. So. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me? Today we're celebrating Joyce's birthday. She had a little surprise of a uh, son-in-law, a daughter, uh, our youngest son, and his girlfriend, Daniela. She speaks Spanish, Pastor. Bienvenida. <laughs> she spent most of her young life in Mexico. She's very kind and polite. She was robbed down there, and the guy said, give me your wallet. So she did. And then she said, I have car keys, too. Would you like those? (laughs) Uh, And then uh, way at the end, Robert and Maya, they belong to these two. Happy birthday, Joyce. You want to say something? Thank you. It was a nice surprise. And Monica brought me coffee from Starbucks, so I was really happy, too. (laughs) Um, And this is Marshmallow that came with us today, too. Um, I that I want to share with you. Um, Janet Hatfield and I were talking this morning, and she says that after eight months, Jim is coming home on Wednesday. So we're very excited about that. Although she has been single for eight months, so she'll have to adjust. And the other um, joy is also with sadness. Um, Today is Clara Huffaker's last regular Sunday here. She will be moving to Arthur, Illinois, but she will be in Fellowship Hall, so you can all say goodbye to her before she leaves. Where Where is she? Over there. Sorry, there there you are. (laughs) Hi, my name... Hi, my name is Susie Maley, and uh, for several weeks we've asked for prayers for our nephew, Scott. He had a kidney transplant yesterday, uh, excuse me, Friday. Uh, Everything went very well. The donor was a family friend of over 40 years, so that's just an an amazing amazing part of family. Uh, He was able to go home uh, on Saturday, like the next day. Unbelievable. Scott will be in the hospital another day or two. They just want to be sure everything is good, but... Um, praise God, and thank you so much for all your prayers. Things are going very well. Yes, and we saw the picture that was put on the prayer chain. Yes, thank you. Barbara Dotterman, we at Encore Village lost a very good friend yesterday, uh, Lee Barnes, and she broke her hip just a week ago, and it was all downhill from there. We will miss her. Sorry for your loss. 
Paula Shrey. Um, I would like to ask prayers for Linda Riggs. She has traveled down to Southern Illinois to be with her dad, and when I spoke with her last night, he was unconscious most of the day yesterday. He did rally for a little bit, and she was able to put him on the phone with her daughter, but she just asked for prayers. Hospice is there and supporting her, but she hopes that God calls him home soon. Thank you. Good morning, Kimberly Hornstein. I have a joy that my father-in-law, Robert, came to visit us at church today to listen to what's going to be an amazing performance <laughs> with our bells choir uh, due to another joy, Heather just rocking it for us and being patient with all of us. Hi, uh, Clinton Cole. Uh, two prayers. One for a friend of ours named uh, Tony Graves. He passed away uh, to kidney uh, complications, uh, and his family is struggling with it, so just prayers for the Graves. And the second prayer, uh, if for a moment, if we could uh, forget about the nationality where these six men came from, and a prayer for those that was lost on the uh, bridge. They were working men, doesn't matter where they came from, but it was six people who were doing stuff to provide for their family. So if we could just say a prayer, a prayer for their families that are suffering. Doesn't matter if they're from Chile, Honduras, it doesn't. They were men who were trying to provide for them. Uh, my name is Don Abbott, and I uh, just wanted to highlight something I saw, and uh, I know you all don't get the newspaper anymore on the Daily Herald, but uh, one of the major se uh, sections, not the front page, but inside, uh, there's a resident over at uh, Brookdale. His name is Bernie Bluestein, and he's, 100, he's a 100-year-old veteran, and he had a special task during, I think it was World War II, he was part of the Ghost Army. The Ghost Army was basically, um, he built, uh, for lack of a better term, balloons that looked like tanks, and they were set up on, on the beaches and stuff, so from a distance they actually looked like tanks. And uh, something that was highlighted in the Herald today is that back on uh, March 21st of this year, he was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor at uh, um, Capitol Hill. So, you know, Thank you to all our veterans that have come, come and gone, and for those that are still living and visiting with us today. Thank you. I invite you now to bow our heads in prayer. Gracious Lord, we thank you that you walk beside us as we journey through, through life. And because you are with us, we accept each new day with its joys and sorrows as a gift. Because you are with us, we gain courage to meet the challenge of the day, choosing life and not death as we move through time. And we thank you, Lord, that we, come, come to you, we can come to you and lift up our prayers, especially for brothers and sisters who who are living th through Good Friday. Uh, they are going through grief and stress and the loss of loved ones, especially we pray that your resurrection will give life to those who are lifeless and those who are just going through the emotions because they have lost loved ones, especially those who uh, were lost at the bridge collapse. Provide for the families that are left without a father, a companion. For those kids that are now don't have a parent at home, be with them. And be with them through the understanding of friends and neighbors and, and family around them. Lord, we pray also for, for those who are celebrating life 
in our midst. For those who are celebrating healing, those who are going through transition to new home, like Clara, we ask that you continue to walk with her, that she will find a great community there where she can continue to worship you. But also, her new home will be a place that everyone is welcome, everyone is received with love and hospitality and care. We pray, O oh Lord, for the miracles of science, especially for those who have received a kidney transplant or liver transplant. We have so many people among us who are having resurrection because of, of medicine, because of that great gift of sharing life with those who need it. Continue to provide for them that their uh, cells and organs work in tandem and there is no rejection, <clears throat> but just a promising future ahead. Lord, we also pray for, for those who are going home, especially for Jim, who has been battling uh, illness for such a long time. And may he be able to, to walk properly and uh, straight, tall, as he gets home to begin a new life surrounded by those he loves and eating the food he likes and loves so much. We pray, O oh Lord, for, <clears throat> for those who also celebrate accomplishments, those who have given their life to, in the service of this country, and for those who uh, continue to serve in so many places. Lord, we, we pray also that the, the hope of resurrection is, is given to, to those who are going through despair, through hopelessness. And we, we pray also that the, the resurrection gives courage to those who want to, to put aside dysfunction or, or abuse or addiction in their own lives and to focus instead on embracing uh, life-giving and life-affirming realities and purposes. Lord, here we are, your people. We also are seeking something for ourselves. And may your resurrection power uh, give, give power to us who want to bring newness to the human heart, to the human spirit. We want to bring joy to sad places, uh, and laughter to a broken world. <clears throat> and may your resurrection today give us good news and confidence, especially to those of us who are called to witness to the good news of resurrection and the power of God's love in Jesus Christ. May we experience today, O oh Lord, new birth, new beginnings, but also as you take also our bigger, big questions of life, you will give us your presence, your answer, your company. All this we pray, Lord, knowing that with faith and love we can endure all things through the resurrected Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Among the first Christians, there were no needy people because those who were rich brought their own resources to be shared. And, and they gave up, they gave up the, their, their positions of privilege, they gave up their advantages so that the needs of all could be met. And out of the rich legacy that they have passed on to us, we bring today our tithes and offerings in thanksgiving for all God's gifts. I invite the ushers now to receive our tithes and offerings.
Please rise as you are able. join me in the prayer of dedication. May our gifts and our time and energy be used to offer food to the hungry, hope to the despairing, joy to the grieving, and peace to the broken. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. And we welcome now the awesome performance. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. 
and now rise for the reading of the gospel. The reading today comes from John 20, verses 19 to 31. Jesus appears to the disciples. It was the evening of the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Jesus came and stood among them. He told them, peace be with you. After saying this, he showed them his hands and his side, and when they saw the Lord, the disciples were overjoyed. Jesus told them again, peace be with you. Just as the Father has sent me to you, so I am sending you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and told them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you, if you forgive people's sins, they are forgiven. If you retain people's sins, they are retained. Jesus appears to Thomas. Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, wasn't with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples kept telling him, We've seen the Lord. But he told them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, put my finger into them, and put my, sides into, my hand into his side, I'll never believe. A week later, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. Even though the doors were shut, Jesus came, stood among them, and said, Peace be with you. Then he told Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Take your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus told him, it is because you've seen me that you have believed. How blessed are those who have never seen me and yet have believed. This is the word of God for the people of God. Please be seated. Many of you probably are, are very familiar with the story of Thomas, right? You have heard it many times. And we've always known him, at least in my case, uh, uh, being raised in a Catholic environment, uh, always was downing Thomas, you know. Poor guy. He has been given a bad rap, you know. We often judge people by one mistake. One mistake and you are done. Take David, for instance, King David. We remember he killed Uriah to have his wife Bathsheba. Jacob is remembered because he stole his brother's birthright. Peter, we remember his denial. Oh, what about the woman dubbed the Central Park Karen? Remember? I probably you don't remember. Uh, and this is what happens to Thomas. And no doubt that he showed great faith many times. But we remember him for his doubt. I mean, and, and, and we call him the doubter. Don't we have doubts too? I mean, I do. I do. Thomas didn't believe until Jesus came to him. But honestly, would any, would any of us be so different where we faced with what Thomas confronted? If, Jesus, if the disciples had come to you and said, yeah, we have seen the Lord. And you have your own mindset. And you have said, yes, sure, yes. Praise be to God. Probably not. Everything else we know about Thomas is found in the Gospel of John. In the other Gospel, he's just mentioned as one of the disciples. But here in John, we know him only in three occasions. We first meet Thomas in scene uh, in John 11. In this episode, Jesus was returning to Judea, to Lazarus. He was going back to Judea because Lazarus was dead. But Jesus is a persona non grata in the region of Jerusalem. And, and, but Thomas, knowing that, encourages the disciples to head right into the danger zone. And if necessary, to die, necessary to die with Jesus. Because they had wanted to kill Jesus when he was there. So here we see Thomas, not the doubter, 
He's not, he's not a doubter. He, he is not a coward. This Thomas is Thomas the Brave. If you fast forward a few more chapters to John 14, where Jesus is at the Last Supper, and he's talking all these you know, big theological terms, and, and I'm sure the disciples are a little puzzled and not understanding, and they don't want to show their ignorance. But, and Jesus says, he is going to prepare a place for his friends. <clears throat> and Thomas honestly says, you know, Lord, I, I don't get it. I don't get it. I don't know what you're talking about. We don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? You know, show us an address, a destination. And while the other disciples hide in their, the veneer of pretending to understand what Jesus is saying, Thomas has the integrity to ask the hard questions. So this is not Thomas the doubter. This is Thomas the honest. But see here what I'm doing? I hear I'm in a, in a campaign to rescue Thomas from infamy. When the women returned to the tomb, the male disciples didn't initially believe, and why believe a woman? But they, have, they had to have a personal encounter with the risen Christ, just as Mary had in the garden, and just as Thomas did later. I mean, he is far from a skeptic or an unbeliever. He was deeply biblical. Thomas was deep, deeply biblical. Like any pious working class Jews, he believed the ancient prophecies that one day, at the last judgment, God would raise all people from the dead, some to the reward of eternal life, and some to judgment. And here's the thing. Reality came like never before on that Friday, just two days before this scene, when Thomas, Thomas watched as they nail his Lord, his teacher, his friend to the cross. I mean, Jesus was dead. And with him, all the hopes of the past three years had perished as well. So when the disciples come and, and uh, come saying that they have seen Jesus, Thomas doesn't merely doubt them. He just plain doesn't believe believe that the news. And so I suspect that his demand to see and feel the marks of, of the nails in Jesus' hand is less a request for proof than it is mocking the disciples' claim. You know, he makes, he makes that demand, in other, word, in other words, because he knows it will, it will never happen. Of course, people who are dead are dead. It is a request as, as absurd, even ridiculous, as what his friends are claiming. And notice, when Jesus shows up, what happens? He said, you who doubted me. Well, no, he doesn't say that. Jesus shows up. He doesn't rebuke Thomas for one in proof. No. Indeed, Jesus lets him see and touch just as he did with the disciples a week before. Well, we don't know if Thomas actually took Jesus up on that offer. I'm sure you have seen the picture of Caravaggio, Caravaggio, where Jesus is, where Thomas is really touching, you know, kind of putting the finger. But we don't know that. But Thomas, Thomas has his encounter with Jesus. And what we know that, at that moment, that G Thomas cried out, My Lord and my God. Thomas calls it like he sees it, 
once he sees it. But then Jesus go on, goes on to say, for the benefit of us all who will follow Thomas and hear this story, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. That line is intended for us, by the way, of course. We who cannot see, who cannot verify, and yet are invited to the blessings of faith in Jesus Christ, nonetheless. To paraphrase a, a traditional aphorism, if you don't have faith, then there, will, then there will never be evidence enough to convince you. And if you do not have faith, no evidence is needed. Without faith, no evidence is sufficient. With faith, no evidence is necessary. And although most of us probably agree with that in principle, we can perhaps admit that sometimes we are still hungry for a little evidence, you know, like the one that the disciples got. But really, we don't have that kind of proof for any of the things that are most important to us, do we? Yeah. How can we conclusively prove love or friendship or hope or faith? How can you prove it? I mean, we, can, we can't. We know they exist. Yes, we feel them. So, folks, Thomas... I'm in my campaign now, you know, campaign mode, because, yes, this is the year. I'm not talking about politics, by the way. Thomas doesn't deserve the rap that he's got. Other people, do, they do, yes, they do. But Thomas does not deserve the rap he's got, because Thomas is no worse than the other disciples. Perhaps it is it is time to let Thomas be our guide, not to be afraid to ask questions or seek evidence. God can stand up to it. And more importantly, however, I think we, actually, we have actually misunderstood the nature of faith altogether. Assuming, you know, assuming that the more faith we have, the fewer questions we will ask. Mm -mm. But the Bible offers a different picture of faith, one in which faith and doubt are, are kind of uh, woven much closer together than we might imagine. Faith, after all, isn't knowledge, but instead as the Bible says, is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Hebrews 11, 1. Our faith, or at least mine, my faith is not a blind faith. The Bible never says, you must not have doubts, for it is a sin. But rather, you must struggle with your doubts until you reach certainty to accept, accept the amazing reality that is the resurrection and the revelation that Jesus is our Lord and our God. Thomas acknowledged, acknowledged Jesus as the Christ. And then after that, his faith became strong and vibrant. And there is an early tradition that Thomas is the one who took the gospel to India. And he founded a church there. Now, one of the great theologians of the faith, Tertullian, made an important point when he said something about the early Christians. And I quote, No man would be willing to die unless he knew he had the truth. 
End quote. The disciples would not have died for a dream. They would not have been loyal to a figment of their imagination. Thomas emerged victorious and became faithful unto this in his witness for God. Because he knew the truth. I have always admired a mother, Teresa. And after her death in 1997, reports emerged about the severe doubts she expressed in her personal journal. Severe doubts. And in a lecture on doubt by Peter Enns, he quotes uh, his, this story about her. He says, There is a wonderful story of Jesuit philosopher John Cavanaugh. In 1975, he went to work for three months at the House of the Dying in Calcutta with Mother Teresa. He was searching for an, for an answer about how best to spend the remaining years of his life. On his first, very first morning there, he met Mother Teresa. He asked, she asked him, what can I do for you? Kavano asked her to pray for him. What do you want me to pray for? She asked. And he answered with a request that was the very reason he traveled thousands of miles to India. Please pray, pray that I have clarity. Mother Teresa said firmly, no, I will not do that. When he asked her why, she said, clarity is the last thing you are clinging to and must let go of. When Kavan then, uh, uh, when Kavanaugh said, well, you always seem to have clarity. She laughed and said, I have never had clarity. What I have always had is trust. So I will pray that you trust God. Jesus brings us to a confession that may or may not have clarity. But at its heart is trust. That, it seems, took Thomas to, to India. And the effects of, of his faith are still felt today. So whatever, whatever else you may think about Thomas, remember this. When the chips are down... He was willing to die for Jesus' sake. He was willing to expose his ignorance in order to know the truth. And when Jesus came back to show him his hands and his side, he had the courage to lay aside his doubt and confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Friends, friends, dare to be more like a little bit more like Thomas. Honest about your doubts. Strong in your faith. Faithful in doing your best. The best you know right where you are. Because after all, Thomas is your brother. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you now to um, follow the uh, liturgy for communion. I invite the um, communion stewards to come up to the front. I forgot the word. His communion stewards, yes.
And the liturgy is, uh, will be on the screens, but if you want to follow in your hymnals, it's on page 13. And I remind you that, that this is the Lord's table. You're all invited here because you're all welcome. You all belong. Uh, I understand that sometimes we have people from different traditions, but we respect the fact that if you would like to be here, join us, you are more than welcome. This is the Lord's table, not the table of the United Methodist Church. Lift up your hearts. Let us, give, let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, God Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join there and end in him. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. Deliver us from slavery to sin and death, and make with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from these, all of you, this is my blood, of the new covenant put out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here. And on these gifts of bread and wine. May them be for us the body and blood of Christ. That we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit make us one with Christ. One with each other. And one in ministry to all the world. Until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now, with the confidence of children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. the body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ given for you. Friends, we will have three stations. Uh, to the one on my right will be uh, regular bread. To my left, regular bread. And here in the center, we will have gluten-free. All you have to do is take the bread and immediately uh, take it, eat it, and then you will receive the cup and you can uh, drink it right away. There are uh, uh, tables there where you can dispose the, the little cups 
that you receive. Please welcome. All of you are welcome. Come to the table. And I will serve our communion stores first. Please rise as you are able for the closing hymn, Thine Be the Glory.
As God sent Christ to us, now Christ sends us to the world. But let us go down into the streets and do as he asks, allowing his grace to overpower our doubt and his peace to overcome our fear. And now the blessing that comes from the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us all forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated.